Imagine having the opportunity to step into the mind of the late great Napoleon Hill. Hello everybody, we're right here at the headquarters of the Napoleon Hill Foundation with the CEO himself, Don Green, who's going to give us a private behind the scenes tour, a journey so to speak, of what it was like to walk a day in this great man's shoes. First of all, thanks for letting us take a look and I gotta say there's amazing things around here and I was looking around the shelves and I happened to find this, a Think and Grow Rich book, but more importantly, it's one autographed by the man himself. I guess you don't have too many of these laying around, do you? <laughs> we got a few of them. He signed these. Um, as you can see, it's still got the advertising piece in it. It was from the archives. Uh, Hill died in 1970, so he signed a bunch of them before he uh, passed away. I think it's interesting about him is that uh, people don't realize, but his name was actually Oliver Napoleon Hill. And he did his first writings as Oliver, even when he went to work for Bob Taylor. And he dropped the uh, Oliver and just started going by Nap Napoleon Hill by the time he published his first magazines in 1919. He was strictly going as just Napoleon Hill. These little blue books right here, would you share with everyone what those are? Yeah. When he was working in Atlanta, Georgia, in human resources for a company called Lee Torno, he worked for them because they were trying to unionize, they were having personnel problems, and they hired him in human resources. He wrote a little a book, 17 of them, on the principle of success, and he refers to them in his writings as mental dynamite. Now, one of the greatest releases that the foundation's put out in its generation is Outwitting the Devil. I mean, it's been an international success story with Sharon Lecter, but I guess this is the original manuscript that's, that it came from. That's it. So this is what he actually typed with his hands. Manual typewriter. Wow, one finger at a time, like by the way I yeah. do it. Huh? No, no L.B. Smith typewriter. Absolutely amazing. Mm, this must be priceless. Well, I gotta tell you, when I was going through a lot of the different gems you have here, this has got to be my all-time favorite. In fact, I think I might even sneak this one out when I get out of here. This right here is one of the uh, uh, Think and Grow Rich editions where they were making some changes to it, as you told me, and he actually went through and made his personal notes of what could be left in and what should be left out. I mean, this is just absolutely a priceless gem. That's the reason that the 37 edition is about 100 pages more than the book it's traditionally published today, though we publish it in both current and the 37 edition. That was the book that was edited personally by Hill to get the edition that we have today. Yeah, I'd say this, you have a lot of priceless uh, you know, things around here, but this has got to be, in my opinion, uh, the greatest one you've got. Hill founded the Napoleon Hill Foundation in 1962. He's 79 years old, and for the public out there that don't know, Hill left all the books to the foundation, and they stories out there that Hill died broke. He wrote the material but didn't do it. Here's a guy who had his ups and downs, but when he died, his stuff went to Andy Lou, except for the books worth a fortune. They went to the foundation because he wanted a nonprofit set up. It wasn't very active because I said he was 79 years old. But I have Mrs. Uh, Hill's will. She had more than a million dollars in cash, and she never worked. So it all come from Hill and she had a lot of other assets, real estate, stocks and so forth. So no, he didn't die broke. One of the greatest things that you do, Don, is you're an avid note taker. In fact, I guarantee in your top pocket, you got a three by five index card so you can remember who you spoke to and what was said. What do you do with all that content? I accumulate them, especially if the fact is, I think that it's someone that I'll be contacting again later and it's just a refresher and I, I can refer back to what was said and, and so forth and it just comes in very nice as a follow-up. We've been out on a family field trip, so to speak. We saw incredible things, Don. Now, most people don't know this, but he's got an abundance of material. You said he started writing at, what, 13 years old? 13. And then he stopped writing at what age? Well, about 84 uh, is active. Uh, he lived to be 87, but he had some health problems. But he actually published one book, You Can Work Your Own Miracles. It was published a year after he died. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's a long time ago surpassed a million sales in English alone. That's amazing. So, and what I loved about it is we got to go to the storage facility. And you mm -hmm. said there's quite a few of these, but boy, we did some digging in there and I could not believe what we discovered. Imagine feeling like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> oh my, we just opened up a storage facility, the archive, so to speak, of Napoleon Hill Foundation. And we have no idea what's inside. Don, just show us. What goodies you got for us? Well, let's see. 
This is real from uh, in Hollywood, California. It's real number two. Wow, look at that. Acme Film Laboratories. <laughs> like the Wile E. Coyote or something like that. Over here, you also have amazing items. Right here, he's got cassette tape. Napoleon Hill selling you the original audio version of it. What do you do when you just stumble across these things? I mean, it just must be amazing. We continuously take the old films and the old tapes and convert them to uh, CDs or DVDs for just to preserve them. Because like, Hill had a radio program during World War II when he left Georgia and went to Hollywood, California. He had a program, a Sunday afternoon program with Warner Brothers where people could call in and get questions and we have those on audio. All I know is going back here, you've got boxes and boxes, cases and cases of nothing but golden gems inside. Can't wait to do so a little bit of digging. I think I'm gonna have to take my jacket off for this one. I can't believe it, that freeway marker that you helped erect in the honor and the legacy of Napoleon Hill, will you tell us about it? Yeah, Greg, it's one of my goals to get the uh, Virginia State Historical Society to erect a marker in Hill's name. It's just great for him to be recognized. I know he was the first individual to be recognized in Wise County, and I believe he's the only author to be recognized in the state of Virginia. Wow, absolutely amazing. And I gotta tell you, it looked Fantastic. It's all the cars passing by. I wonder how many pull over and really take a look. It's on US 23 North as you leave Wise. You can't miss it. Also, we took a field trip to Pound, a little town called Pound. And what people might not know is that uh, this is where Napoleon Hill was actually born. Yes, he was born in a little one room log cabin. Wow. And uh, very primitive. Uh, the stone fireplace served as both cooking and heating. Mm. Very primitive. And also there was a, a monument constructed for him in his name, in his honor with a, some other elite people. So much so that you commissioned a mural to be made. What made you do that? Well, I just thought it was an honor for him. Uh, they had been some done. Uh, I heard some of the ladies in the Historical Society mention it, and uh, it just seemed like the thing to do. Well, I got to uh, tell you, it turned out fantastic. It really did. And we also had a chance to go on a little field trip to the schoolhouse. Could you tell us about the schoolhouse? The schoolhouse is up on what we call uh, Laurel Grove. And uh, at that time, school wasn't mandatory. We had the first schools in 1875, one room. Most of the teachers had very limited amount of education because at that time, boys went to work and girls got married. Mm -hmm. And there was a little emphasis put on the education. Now, I understand that Napoleon Hill started writing uh, when he was 13 years old. Do you think he got his education majority from that little structure? Uh, yeah, I think so. His, uh, his stepmother was an educated person. Uh, she was a widow, a high school principal, and her dad was a doctor. She traded his gun at age 13 for a typewriter and taught him how to type, and he started typing little stories up, news events, and he once said was he, when he wasn't in the news, he made some news up. <laughs> I love it. And then we had a chance to go to one of his icon's property, General Ayers. Now, I love this story because he wanted to surround himself with the most powerful people who are getting the results that he wanted for himself. So he actually volunteered to work for free, basically be an apprentice. What'd you make of that? And I know he picked him because he was no doubt the richest man in the county. This was a guy that was buying 10,000 acres of land at one time. And uh, he wanted to go for him because of his wealth. And he wrote him a letter offering to work for him for free. He wanted him to learn on his way not just have someone paying him, he wanted to learn why some people are successful and others were not. And that's what he spent his lifetime defining. Now, let's talk about where we ended up off our journey today, over at the cemetery. And we looked at some of the tombstones. Who did we have an opportunity to go visit? Well, the first one was his mother. Uh, you know, his mother died before she was 25 years old. Hill had not had his eighth birthday. You know, it had to be in, uh, a tragedy, but he said it actually turned into a blessing because about one year later, his dad married a widow woman who was educated and she took a liking to him and mentored him. And he said later about his stepmother, almost the identical thing that Lincoln said about his stepmother. He said, anything I ever am or aspire to be, I owe to that dear woman. She, she always had faith in him. And then we visited the uh, grave of his father, who was a local dentist, also his brother Paul, and um, his stepmother. I just think it's 
really neat that you are keeping that legacy alive, Don. I mean, it's absolutely amazing that somebody would take it their personal responsibility and duty to make sure that this legacy lives on. I mean, it's, it's, it's fabulous. And here's what I love. We get to go to the next room, your library, so to speak, and take a little look around. I want to say thanks again for giving us this opportunity to have a little sneak peek into the day in the life of Napoleon Hill. I know there's a lot of versions of Think and Grow Rich. In fact, it's public domain, yet there's only one official Think and Grow Rich version from the Napoleon Hill Foundation. And I gotta say, it's really neat that you've also had it done in many different languages around the world. Right here is a collection of some of them. I'll give you us an example. Here's one done in China. <laughs> Holy smokes, look at this right here. I mean, J.B. Hill, is that J.B.? That's J.B. This is Napoleon Hill's grandson, J.B. Hill. It's good to see you. I got a question for you. Yeah. When you were a kid, weren't you given a copy of Think and Grow Rich by your grandfather? Yeah, but it wasn't the Chinese edition. <laughs> you could actually read it. Yeah. He actually handed it to me, he put it in my hands. And uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, my parents had uh, taken me up to meet my granddad. And as we were leaving, he came down uh, to the car. He was wearing a white shirt, no coat, no tie. First time I've ever seen him without a coat and tie. Oh. And he handed me the book and said read it. Well, later on in life, I understand you actually started not only reading the book, but you started applying the principles into your own personal life. Well, I read it that year. It didn't, mm. it didn't mean anything to me, but later at a time when I needed the book, I, I sold it at the Piggly Wiggly in Jacksonville, North Carolina, in the checkout stand, and I picked the book up and took it home and read it. I read it twice that weekend, and I decided I'd do what my grandfather told me to do, mm. which is apply that philosophy. Well, you can end this whole segment here at the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Why don't you do us a favor and tell our audience, I mean, of all the takeaways that you've had from this incredible journey, what's the biggest one that's made the biggest impact in your life? That it's up to me. Mm. That if I'm going to change my life, it's going to be up to me. That's right. Remember that. You literally could be just three feet from gold. Mm.